your cash. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Future Now show. Today, we're joined by futurist Brett King, speaker, international best-selling author, and host of The Futurist. Hi, Brett. Thanks for joining our show. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's fair turnabout because we've just had you on our show a couple of times recently. So uh, thanks for the invite. Yes, we, we just got to keep it going. That's right. Churning out that content. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I wanted to have you on the show today so we could talk about building a better future for humanity through the world of business. And your latest book, The Rise of Technosocialism, came out. And there's a lot in that book that I feel is very important for uh, today's uh, vision of the future when it comes to business and uh, where we're heading ultimately for humanity. So let's I'd talk like to about think it. so. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to think <laughs> so. I mean, um, yes. I think the biggest thing is that um, I think business is going to have to go through a philosophical change, a philosophical shift. You know, I, I think we're reaching the limits of, of what we can do with capitalism. And I know for many people that'll be, you know, like an, an attack on their religion of capitalism. But, you know, it, Silence, it's, it's communist. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but um, no, it's 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 like, well, if if capitalism was perfect, a perfect system, we wouldn't have climate change. Um, you know, as an example. So, um, you know, we wouldn't have inequality. So there, there, there are flaws in it. And I think, you know, the way I illustrate this, if I get into this as an argument with someone who argues about capitalism, I say, listen, in 10,000 years, you know, if you can imagine hu humanity evolving and progressing and, and so forth, in 10,000 years, do you really believe that capitalism is the very best system we could ever have come up with? And, you know, if the answer to that is no, if you can envision a time where we've got something better, then why shouldn't we be aiming for that now instead of in 10,000 years, right? So, yeah. So, speaking of which, how can we move away from the hopefully soon to be old paradigm of survival and competition because we got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps right in order right. to compete and get one over on someone in order to to win and survive well you know i i think that isn't in, in itself is a flawed element um you know you don't really see other species well you see other species competing for resources so that's that is true. But, um, you know, even when you look at in the animal kingdom, you, you, you look at tribes in the animal kingdom or co collections of animals, they tend to work together, you know. And so if you if you think, you know, like the ant colony as an example, right, um, if you think of that as an analogy for human society, we'd actually be far better off competing for a common purpose than we would be competing against each other. Uh, so when when you are competing for a common purpose, then you you are able to align resources with that. You're able to align economics with that, and you know you are you creating a better world for the whole instead of you know some people have to lose so you win. You know, and and that's I think the flaw that we have in capitalism is it 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 forces us to fight and compete against each other, and as we move into sort of the post scarcity abundance world which is possible with ai and with the technology advancements we're like making like fusion um you know generators and so forth all of that means that you know when you don't need to compete for resources in the way we have we need that new purpose we need that new sort of uh, collective vision of of where humanity could be going and I, and I believe we could make much faster advancement as a species and you know, therefore, be much more prosperous as a whole if we committed to that ideal. Right now, <laughs> in your book, there's four different outcomes, four different paths of where we're going. Right? What are those avenues we're going down? Because today, right, it kind of seems like the corporate world. There's this vision of a dark dystopian future where 
corporations control everything and there's this super rich at the top and they right. have access to life extension you know how many sci-fi movies like elysium right have you exactly seen this in, right you know we're living at elysium and the people in the bottom are you know fighting over you know black market tech and all this stuff and it's really dirty and uh really dystopian right like so there's that vision of the future and then there's the more utopian vision of, well, we've got it all figured out. Welcome to Star Trek. And uh, here everything's taken care of. And now we're out into the stars. Right. Uh, yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? You know, where where are we now? Where are we heading? Oh, um, well, you know, this this was um, when Richard and I were whiteboarding on the concept of the book, this sort of became a central you know, part of the thesis, you know, what are the organizing principles of society? So we basically tracked it on two um, axes. And the first was, um, you know, whether you have a collective scheme or whether you focus more on the individual, right? So if you, if you look at the Chinese, um, you know, political system versus the US political system. Um, well, European versus US is maybe a better example. You know, you have a lot of democratic socialist countries in Europe, but um, generally speaking, um, there's a much greater sense of community in Europe. And, you know, you have to do things for the good of the community as well. Whereas in the States, it's like, well, my gun rights trump your rights for safety. You know, my, you know, my uh, uh, ability as a billionaire to um, reduce my tax uh, workload is just, you know, is, is something that the market gives me the ability to do. So, you know, that sort of very individualistic focus versus more collective visions is one axis. And the other is sort of planned versus unplanned, right? Um, or chaotic, um, you know, versus more uh, systemic approach. So this maps out, if, if you look at the plan versus chaotic, you have um, in the top quadrant, um, you know, you have the fail to stand scenario, um, which is, uh, a, a, you know, where we just don't do anything. Um, you know, we just keep uh, so going across, uh, automatically on the direction we're going and you have systemic failure from things like climate change, supply chain collapse, you know, the sort of stuff that we saw a little bit during the pandemic. Then you have the um, reje rejection of technology and automation because of its impact on employment because AI has the ability to sort of disconnect human labor from, um, you know, uh, the employment you know, capital markets and labor markets. And in, in doing so, it sort of destroys the concept where wealth distribution is done through labor. So, you know, that that is ideologically a, a problem for, for capitalism. And then you have the techno-socialist sort of techno-utopian outcome, which is using technology to reduce the cost of government, but make it more efficient at the same time. And, you know, um, smooth out the inequality issues we have. And when you talk about the dark futures or neo-feudalism, we, we call it in the book, where essentially you have this super stratification of the rich versus poor and, you know, those with access to resources, those without, you know, and, um, you know, you have this sort of permanent um, uh, realignment along this. And, and, you know, feudalism is our natural organizing state for humans if you look historically at the way humanity has been organized. So you would think the bets are on for neo-feudalism, but I, I tend to think that as a species, as we advance in knowledge and, um, you know, and sophistication, we realize that actually the, the best outcome, you know, the, the, the only outcome where the human species survives is actually where we have common purpose. That ultimately, sort of that neo-feudalist view, you know, we said in the book, you know, we, we think ultimately would lead to the extinction of the species. So, you know, that's, that's what's at stake, really. Fail to stand, right? I mean, Fail to stand. that's a, <laughs> it seems like that's kind of where we're heading, where it's business as usual all the way down until things just collapse and oops, it is what it is at that point, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, 
you know, how could we have known that this was going to happen? Yeah, you know, we know. We, we know exactly what's happening. You know, we knew climate change was going to happen 50 years ago, um, and, but the market was making tons of profit out of fossil fuels. So why stop the gravy train? And, and that's the problem is putting economics above sort of the core survival of the species is is fraught with uh, you know danger and and you know it's just crazy really when you think of it that way. But um, you know, I mean, so much of our system has been built around economics and the flow of capital and so forth that it's 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 hard to sort of get people off that thinking off that cycle. For sure, right? I mean, there's such so many problems in the West. I mean, particularly in America, right? I mean, I know countless people right now that work multiple jobs yet they can't go to a doctor because they know going to a doctor and discovering something would put them into financial ruin. You, you, yeah, you mentioned a stat recently uh, on Twitter, I believe, and it was talking about uh, what is the, the number one bankruptcy is due to medical? Two, two thirds of all bankruptcy uh, in the United States has a medical cost component to it. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that's insane. But not only that, if you look at the US system, and there's an argument in the US that privatized healthcare works more efficiently, this is the argument. Um, you know, but in reality, the US pays twice the OECD average for healthcare, and the outcomes are worse off than most of the OECD countries. So even even if you're paying a premium and you expect the best healthcare, and this is the mantra in the US, it's not necess- It's not the case. You know, the, the health outcomes are worse, but the health outcomes are worse because people are uh, are opting out of treatment because they can't afford it. So, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's a vicious cycle. The affordability of healthcare and ac- broad access to healthcare, if you monetize that and create a health profitability system instead of a health care system, which is what the US is, then people, as you say, opt out because the cost of health care is too great. And so this means in the United States, we have somewhere between two and three million avoidable deaths every year, people that didn't don't need to die, but because of, uh, you know, their, uh, um, you know, choices, you know, this is this is what's happening. It's, it's a pretty crazy situation. It is. Now, being in the corporate world yourself, having uh, more than one foot in that world, would you say that the business world as a whole is going down this avenue of wanting to change, helping change for the better? Or are they constricted because of this uh, financial paradigm of having to to keep making more and more money, endless growth, uh, or is there action being taken to change any of this right now? I, well, I think there are segments uh, of the market where you see this happening. Um, you, you also see um, brands that are more self-aware, um, you know, for example, brands like Apple, you know, who are now starting to talk about recycling and, you know, the, the you know, commitment to uh, sustainable resources and so forth, um, you know, because they realize that the, you know, public opinion is turning against these organizations just to, that are purely, um, you know, capitalist organizations. You know, we have nicknames for organizations like Goldman Sachs, you know, the, um, you know, Vampire Squid and stuff like this, which doesn't reflect um, kindly on these, you um, um, these organizations who put profit ahead of everything else. But that has been sort of the status quo. But even just the corporate social responsibility and the ESG movements are all attempts to sort of try and um, create a better mission behind uh, corporations. So I think we, if you play this out as a futurist, um, you know, particularly um, with the impact of artificial intelligence and its impact on unemployment, and climate change happening at the same time, you now are going to need to see corporations that are much more purpose-driven for them to have brands that are respected, you know, in the community, um, and brands that don't commit to that sort of, um, you know, uh, community-based uh, intent. I think are going to um, find themselves, you know, um, on the back 
a, 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 you know, sort of the back foot sort of trying to defend their brands or, um, you know, worse uh, going out of business. So I think the natural tendency of the markets in the 2030s in particular will be more to, um, you know, a social driven purpose. Now, what do you think is going to be driving this change? Will it come from these uh, World Economic Forum types? Are, are they going to be helping drive this change from the top down, so to speak? Or would it be better and more, I guess, ideal if the masses, you know, if, if culturally we got together as a whole and demanded these changes? What, what's the best avenue to, to get ahead of this? Good, um, good question. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I tend to be a little skeptical on the World Economic Forum in terms of its ability to produce this, because if you look at who is powering this, it's sort of the wealthiest, um, you know, uh, groups, um, whether that's governments or large corporates and so forth. In the US, of course, um, you know, the reason we have the problem with the healthcare system and the reason we have, you know, problems like climate change is in, in many respects because these, um, you know, corporations have been able to, um, you know, invest in politicians and, and buy, um, you know, through lobbying groups, buy policy, you know, um, and sort of define right. laws that, you know, benefit their organization type. Um, so um, the, you know, history would tell us that um, you've got to break that cycle. So what could help us break that cycle? Well, you know, we, we have seen it, you know, we have seen, um, you know, protests on mass, um, you know, have, have impact. The question is whether or not in, in, you know, um, in a decade or so, whether that has real teeth or whether the sort of surveillance state is able to limit, um, you know, a lot of the damage from that, um, you know, and we see China sort of trying to get that balancing act right now, which is, you know, you could see um, you know, the Chinese people who are still suffering lockdowns, just them watching the World Cup and seeing all of these people at soccer stadiums and so forth celebrating the World Cup was enough to suddenly turn on a dime public opinion there in China, where people were protesting on the streets. And, and China realizes that when it comes to issues like that, they have to respond, you know, um, and listen to the crowd or else, you know, they're their uh, power as a political structure sort of disappears. So overnight, COVID policy changed. So the question is whether we can keep that pressure on the system of governance at the top levels with things like World Economic Forum and so forth, where instead of it just being um, you know, lip service to these issues, where there's actually some teeth in these organizations to make these changes. One book that um, is really interesting and in sort of looking at the potential for this is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, Ministry of the Future, looking at how we might mobilize around um, climate change as an example globally, um, and the fact that this sort of overarching um, sort of policy structure and, uh, you know, actionable government structure came into being because climate change gets so bad in that future in, in his book, you know. So I, I, I like, tend to think that um, that is what's going to be necessary in the future. But, you know, it's, it's a debate, right? Yeah, I mean, there was just the earthquake in Syria and Turkey and right. a lot of people have been talking about that, all the devastation and how companies are, you know, using emerging tech to get in there and help people and whatnot. So a lot of it seems to come down to these uh, catastrophes or disruptions, so to speak, and organizations responding to them. Ideally, uh, we'd have a ministry of the future ahead of time before right. everything collapses, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I, you know, again, um, I, I mean, this is where, you know, our corporation is going to self-select where they will put a percentage of their revenue and income into social issues, or are they going to have to be forced to do that? And this is really comes back to the nature of markets is the markets don't reward companies for doing more socially conscious you know, behavior, they reward corporations for profits. So at, at its heart, I, I think that's what's broken. We have bad incentives in the system. You know, wh why is it that fossil fuels 
are able to kill 10, 10 million people a year with air pollution. Oh. Well, you know, we could have we could have fixed that. You know, we could have changed that. Um, you know, in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, when the environmental movement sort of woke up, you know, we had you know lakes on fire in the US because of chemical dumping and stuff. This is why the EPA was was put in place. Um, but it got, you know, it, it you know, we've seen since an attempt to sort of erode those controls because it's well, you're free market, you know, but um you know, I, I think ultimately, um, you know, if, if corporations are doing damage like that, even if they are producing um, profits, it's, it's, it's the, there's an imbalance there. It's what we would call in economic terms, perverse incentives, right? So that we have to change those incentives. How do we change those incentives? We, we have to reduce the power of the share market as a, as a metric, and we have to start evaluating companies in different ways. So they're, you know, whether they're carbon neutral, whether they new, use renewable uh, um, you know, and sustainable uh, strategies, um, you know, do they have um, strategies in place for introduction of artificial intelligence and what happens to the humans they lay off in the workforce? So they, do they have a commitment to help those people People that are replaced by artificial intelligence find new employment, or you know, um, and so forth. These are all uh, mechanisms which would be quite sensible in respect to creating markets that are, are healthy, you know, um, you know, for for humanity versus uh, you know just survival of the fittest, as as you've said. Yeah, I mean, going back to uh, the EPA. There was just a huge train derailment in Ohio. I know. Where right? 30 cars, 30, 40 cars of all these toxic, super carcinogenic chemicals have dumped uh, all into the ground, all into the waterways. And the response to it was barely non existent. I mean, it took exactly. outrage just to get in the media, right? So yeah. it's kind of scary. It's not just the climate change, you know, it, right. it is that, but it's it's planet poisoning. Yes. And it's happening so rapidly, people don't realize. I mean, yeah. just in a hundred years, waterways that were like swimmable and nice. I know in New York, right? I mean, we used to have canals that people used to swim in, not even couple decades ago right and now i mean you wouldn't want anyone to dip a toe in that water because it's just so rank you know i mean that was that was what happened during um the pandemic because we stopped traveling and we had these lockdowns and so forth for the first time in almost 100 years you could see the bottom of the canals in venice you know um you had um um, there's a David Attenborough special that he had, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I can't remember the year in something that he, but, you know, you had, a, um, you know, wild animals returning to cityscapes and stuff like that, you know, so the, the earth can repair itself if we allow it to, but we can't just keep dumping chemicals in and doing that. We, you know, we can live sustainably with the planet if we choose to, that's the thing. And then why wouldn't you choose? The only reason you wouldn't choose to live sustainably is because there's economic incentives not to. And that's the problem at the heart of it, right? It's we don't true. want to incentivize I mean, people to make, we don't want to incentivize corporations to make bad decisions that detract from the quality of life um, or, um, you know, impact other species, frankly. You know, part of the um, philosophical advancement of humanity is that we respect intelligence more broadly and we respect, you know, other species that coexist with us on this planet. You know, we don't do that today you know we we again we think we're the alpha species and this gives us the right to to do this but we're facing like the sixth extinction right now because of that strategy it's not it's not a healthy um you know it's it's certainly not going to lead to a healthy and prosperous future for humanity right if we want a bright future for future generations a clean cleaner planet we have to start living with integrity and doing it ourselves lead by example. You know, why are people throwing cans and bottles into waterways? Yeah. I mean, we, we were in Thailand, right? Uh, you went scuba diving and you were <laughs> scuba diving uh, picking, and picking up trash up all from the, the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, it's, but little things like that, it, it inspires others to do the same and, Hopefully, you know, speaking of Davos and the World Economic Forum and all that, you know, they, they talked about COVID and a new social contract. 
well, we should have a new social contract, but for a better future for humanity, not just responding to a crisis, scaring people, you right. know, using jail terms like lockdowns, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. there's a better way to go about it. Now, in a in a more happier, brighter uh, future <laughs> discussion, <laughs> moving on, uh, let's talk about Singularity University, Peter Diamandis, Ramiz Nam, that whole group, you know, there's a lot of discussion about leveraging emerging technologies and creating an abundant future for humanity. Is that possible? Is that something that's actually being worked on right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, there are obviously people sort of thinking about this and investing, but I think one of the sort of interesting ways to illustrate this, um, you know, might be, um, uh, you know, what happens when we go to Mars? Um, mm. You know, like, so if you start thinking about designing a society in on Mars, um, you know, what would it, what would it look like? Um, you, you know, you, you, the first thing, you, you know, Elon has said this, uh, the first thing you got to do is, is make the um, thing self-sustainable so that if the starships stop coming to supply the goods and services that, um, you know, that you can still survive as a colony. So this, um, you know, uh, the, it, the Mars trilogy, again, written by Kim Stanley Robinson, explores this from an economics perspective, what sort of economic paradigm would emerge on Mars when you have the entire colony looking for this sort of self-sustainability and prosperity. And you get this sort of sustainable prosperity doctrine. Um, uh, Stan um, calls it eco-economics, right, or eco-poetics, where you essentially align the, you know, the ecology with the the economic system. And so there, there is potential to create this sort of new social order that al allows you that flexibility. But it's, it's tough because, um, you know, um, it, it, the, the, the corporations are going to fund these sorts of expansionism, you know, such as going to Mars, and then they get to define the rules, rules by which they operate. So that's sort of really the challenge, you know? It is definitely a challenge, right? I mean, you know, not just Mars, I understand what you're saying. And Mars would be great to, to do over again, you know, having a fresh planet to rebuild society upon. But I mean, can we try to do something here? you know, in the meantime? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is part of the reason I wrote the book it, it is sort of trying to get people to think about this, you know, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think climate is going to force us, climate change is going to force us to do that. I mean, think about the fact that we're going to have a billion eco refugees. At some point, you know, you, you have to say that, a billion people being affected by this and saying, well, who's going to pay for it is no longer a valid question. The, the cost of in lives of people being displaced by climate, by flooding, you know, um, by food scarcity and all of those the issues doesn't have an economic equivalent. There's no economic equivalent where you can say that a billion lives are worth this much in profits. It just doesn't make sense anymore. So I think, you know, we're going to have to abandon that metric at some point. And I think that's when things really change. Because if you think about the social good today, that's the first question. Who's going to pay for it? And, you know, and if even if you propose it, it's socialism, you know, but, well, shouldn't we be, you know, uh, focusing on the right thing? You know, shouldn't we be focusing on that as a core mission for humanity? This is the philosophical question and discussion. Indeed. Okay, Brett. Well, I understand you're very busy. You've got to move on to your, your next, next big thing. So thank you very much for coming on the show today. Uh, for those who want to check out more of your work, where can we find you? So you can go to brettking.com. That's with a double T. Um, or check out the new podcast, thefuturists.com. Um, we'd love to have you check it out and listen to that. It's uh, it, We've got some, you know, a lot of the people you talked about already have come on the show. And um, I think you'd find it really interesting if you want a more positive view of the future. Indeed. And also go on Amazon, check out his books, Bank 4.0, Augmented Life in the Smart Lane, and The Rise of Technosocialism. All right. Thank you, Brett. Until next time.
Thank you. See you in the future. <laughs>